From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I am Estefania Bravo, and this is From the South. The National Communications Secretary of Ecuador has released a statement in response to several reports of the possible eviction of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange from the Ecuadorian Embassy in London. According to the statement, there is no plan to discuss Assange's case during President Lenny Moreno's trip to the UK. The statement also said that due to the complexity of Assange's asylum and involvement of, of different stakeholders, there is no short or long-term solution in sight for the moment. However, despite Ecuador's vague assurances, concern was once again raised when a white van was seen removing furniture and belongings from the Ecuadorian embassy in London. This follows reports that Ecuadorian President Lenny Moreno and British officials have come to an agreement under which Ecuador will withdraw its asylum protection for Julian Assange. The WikiLeaks founder, who is holed up in the embassy, would then be handed over to British authorities, according to reports. A group of Assange supporters gathered outside the Ecuadorian embassy in London protesting against any move to end the WikiLeaks founder's asylum. Do you really think like, the UK government would send Julian Assange back to the US? Or? The current government definitely would do that, yeah. They, I, I mean, like, I would presume so, but not. They, they obviously, you know, with Brexit, they're, they're, they're clinging to America wherever they can. They're, 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 uh, the way they're going at the moment. That, that, that is the direction they're going. They definitely, they stick to America where, wherever they can. Definitely, yeah. Telesur's Pablo Navarrete brings us the latest from London. The founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, could be spending his last hours, if not days, in the Ecuadorian embassy of the UK based in London um, after an article um, in The Intercept by Glenn Greenwald, the journalist, has detailed how Lenin Moreno's visit to Britain in which uh, he arrived on Friday, um, ostensibly to talk at the uh, Global Summit, uh, Disabled Summit, where he'll be talking on Tuesday. The article says that the real reason is for Lenny Moreno to have high-level talks with the British government to um, effectively uh, hand over Julian Assange to the British authorities and revoke his uh, status of asylum that was granted under the previous president, Rafael Correa. Now, uh, Lenny Moreno has shown much less uh, sympathy to Julian Assange's case than uh, his predecessor, Correa, did. Um, he has called it a uh, stone in the shoe of Ecuador. Uh, something that was inherited uh, from the Korea presidency. Now Assange, who is now 47, has been in the Ecuadorian embassy since 2012 and the UN has called his, uh, his detention, arbitrary detention by the UK authorities. But it would appear now that his stay at the Ecuadorian embassy uh, is coming to an end. Thank you, Pablo, for your information. And meanwhile, back in Ecuador, several members of the National Electoral Council have been dismissed. Ecuador's Transitory Council for Citizen Participation ordered their removal, claiming that the members failed to comply with their duties. Our correspondent in Quito, Denise Herrera, has the details. The Ecuadorian Temporary Council for Citizen Participation and Social Control voted unanimously to remove all officials of the National Electoral Council. The CNA members will have three days to present an official request to appeal the Council's decision. In some cases, it is clear that resolutions made by the National Electoral Council were linked to the interests of the previous administration. After the Council's resolution, the president of the CNN tweeted a statement rejecting the statement calling it unconstitutional and illegal. The CNN vice president accepted the resolution. As I have said before, I do not plan to make any sort of appeal and I give myself over the council's will. Recent latest actions taken by the temporary council, including the removal of several authorities close to the former government, has some analysts calling the decision authoritarian. 
This institution has served political maneuvering that seeks to dismantle what has been achieved and allow the return of former powers that control the state. It's evident that the council has served a key role in dismantling a system that blocked these corrupt powers from being in control again. The temporary council has also decided to remove the head of the superintendency of banks for allegedly not complying with his duties. During his defense hearing, the superintendent submitted evidence to prove that he had fulfilled all his obligations effectively and professionally. Denise Herrera, Telesur Quito, Ecuador. According to the Cuban government, the draft of Cuba's new constitution opens the path to same-sex marriage. This move would make the country a regional leader in lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. The draft, elaborated by a commission headed by former President Raul Castro, defines matrimony as between two individuals rather than between a man and a woman. While the National Assembly is expected to approve the draft constitution this weekend, it will then be submitted to a popular consultation and the final draft will, will be put to a national referendum. As in the Constitution, marriage was established for heterosexuals, based on heteronormativity, and so I think we have the right to place another vision of marriage that's much more inclusive, that guarantees rights, that up till now we haven't guaranteed. And something I say to a lot of people, giving rights to someone doesn't mean taking them away from those who already have them. Grassroots campaigning in the country for and against gay marriage have made it the most broadly debated proposed constitutional modification. It's joyous, but it comes with major precautions. That's to say that we're looking on. We are keeping an eye on what's going on at the government level with respect to this issue because we do not have any guarantee in our hands. And besides, we know that there is still a process of debate that will be pretty combative on this issue with diverse voices, which is good, but makes us keep an eye on what might happen. What I see in my country is that a great percentage of Cuban society is not comfortable with gay marriage. Most of the Cuban nation is opposed. I think it would be harmful for the Cuban nation. And all this comes as Cuban legislators are meeting for the first regular session of the ninth legislature of the National Assembly, where the country's new cabinet was presented. The president and 605 National Assembly members presented the vice president and members of the ministerial council. All except one of the former vice presidents on the Council of Ministers under Raul Castro will remain in place. Lively debate is also underway about the draft constitutional reform before it is submitted to popular consultation prior to a referendum. To ratify as vice president of the Council of Ministers, commander of the revolution, Ramiro Valdez Menendez, Ricardo Cabriza Ruiz, and Ulises Rosales del Toro, Army Corps General. Leopoldo Sintra Frias as minister of revolutionary armed forces. Vice Admiral Julio Cesar Gandarilla as Minister of Interior, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla as Minister of Foreign Relations. And so the Council of Ministers will be composed of 34 members, with an average after of 60 years old, 8 are women, making up 23%, 9 are black or mixed, so 26%. And so I take advantage of the moment to recognize in this parliament the recognition of work and outlook in the fulfillment of all who fulfill their responsibilities and take on new roles. Thanks to all. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Welcome back. World financial officials are taking part in the G20 summit as finance minister and central bankers in Buenos Aires, Argentina, address global trade conflict. Argentines welcomed International Monetary Fund's chief, Christine Lagarde, who arrived Friday in Argentina with protests and roadblocks in Buenos Aires. Social movements, students, opposition, political parties, and workers' unions have mobilized to reject the IMF once more. IMF chief praised the economic policies promoted by President Macri. And so in Argentina, protests against the IMF continue. Social movements and political parties have rallied in Buenos Aires against the G20 summit taking place in the country. The third meeting of world economic leaders was welcomed with protest against the summit. We reject the presence of the IMF in our country, and we're going to continue to speak out against it until the month of November. We reject imperialism, not just in Argentina, but in all of Latin America. Today in Argentina, our government continues to fail us with hyperinflation and recession. Those who have taken to the street to reject the IMF's policies say the agreement with the fund needs to be broken and no external debt should be paid. That is the way to defend our national economy and the workers of our country. For these protesters, nothing good can come from this summit. This will only bring more hunger and misery to the region. We're fed up with the cuts. We want everyone to know that the people of Argentina are going to do all that we can to prevent these measures from taking place. The people of Argentina will prevent the brutal economic adjustment that they want to implement. The head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, praised the economic policies promoted by President Macri. Macri has become an administrator of an economic dictatorship, backed by the IMF in Washington. This concerns the citizens of the Patria Grande, as Argentinians, but mostly as social militants. We see how the impact of these agreements will hurt the most vulnerable sectors in society. The world economy leaders will meet during the weekend in Buenos Aires. They will analyze topics such as infrastructure, employment, and the global economic situation. Japanese Princess Mako is visiting Brazil to mark the 110th anniversary of the first wave of Japanese immigration to Brazil. Princess Mako, the eldest granddaughter of Emperor Akihito, visited the Christ the Redeemer statue in Rio de Janeiro on July 18th. During her two-week visit, she plans to visit 14 cities in five states and will return home on July 31st. It is Princess Mako's fourth official trip abroad. The recent attacks against Latinos simply for speaking Spanish in the U.S. have been shared on social media. One Guatemalan rock band, Alux Nahual, is fighting back with the song I Speak Spanish y Que, which they hope will raise awareness on racism and xenophobia. This is the most recent single of Guatemalan band Alux Nahua. The band, the singer and writer of the song, says it was made as a response against those who attack Latin American people just for speaking Spanish in the United States. The songs call it I Speak Spanish, y que, we mean don't mess with me, don't harass me for speaking Spanish. Many different languages are spoken in the United States. It actually was made by migrants. So I said in the beginning of the song, you're not Apache, you're not Cherokee. Those were the ones who lived here first. The rest are migrants, so don't complain about migrants of any kind. The band states that it is time for the people to join, to defend against racism and to make clear that no one should be attacked for speaking Spanish. They believe silence will lead to more attacks. It is important for us to express as people, as groups and as individuals, as organizations who think out loud, because remaining silent makes them feel right. And if we don't speak and don't report this, then we are accepting that and supporting the situation. Alux Nahual is known for its social music and protests, not only in Guatemala, but also in Central America. The good thing about a song is you can say many important things, less formally. And I think that these lyrics clearly say what is really happening. We speak one language and they speak another one. But we're all human beings and must be equally respected. The song I Speak Spanish y Que is available on every social network of Alux Nahual, and they plan on recording it with other artists from different Latin American countries. And in El Salvador, internal elections are taking place to choose the nominee for vice president of the FMLN. Our correspondent Ernesto Avalos has the details. 
I'm here in the San Salvador headquarters where internal elections are taking place to elect the candidate of the vice presidency of the FMLN for the 2019 elections. The only person who registered for these elections is Congresswoman Karina Sosa. She must obtain 50% plus one of valid votes in total of 40,000 voters. If elected, she will join presidential candidate Hugo Martinez for the upcoming elections. Elections are to take place on February 3, 2019. Thank you, Ernesto, for your reports. And in Ecuador, the small town of Tabacundo has broken the world record and made it to the Guinness Book of World Record by building the largest rose structure in the world. The enormous structure, which mimics a pre-Hispanic ceremonial center, has been built in the middle of the city's main plaza. It took nearly 1,500 people working an average of 16 hours daily for a week to complete it. The roses cover an area of 1,000 square meters and weigh 30 tons. In 2017, Ecuador exported nearly 159,000 tons of roses, which generated revenues worth of $800 million. In a story you only see on Telesur, a special documentary looking at 25 years after victims of Chevron Tesacos' environmental disaster in the Ecuadorian Amazon filed a lawsuit demanding reparations for its contamination. We spoke with the team behind the documentary, A Cancer in the Amazon, producers Adriano Contreras and Ivan Castañeira. So what this documentary is really about is uh, to sort of bring, bring back this case, which, um, which recently had a, a sort of small victory again with a reaffirmation of the 9.5 billion dollars that Texaco is, te well Chevron Texaco, now part of Chevron, owes uh, the victims here in, in Ecuador in terms of like reparations of, um, of uh, rebuilding, rebuilding, cleaning, uh, health care, uh, cancer treatment, that kind of stuff. Uh, and this documentary sort of really dives into like the testimony. It's fully told by the people in the Ecuadorian Amazon who were completely affected by it. And we went to the Amazon and in the Amazon we spent like three, four days over there. We already have like connections, good connections over there. So they help us like to do things really fast actually. Like going to the old pits, uh, talking with people with cancer, uh, interviewing uh, organizations that are there struggling. In Nicaragua, the Campaign for Justice for the Victims of Terrorism marched to demand justice for families who have suffered during the three months of violence. Some demonstrators were seen holding photos of murdered loved ones and police officers killed during this period. The demonstrator says that since violent protests began in April, innocent people have been kidnapped, tortured, raped and injured, and many have lost homes to vandalism. The violence has also affected many Nicaraguans' ability to go to their jobs, and some no longer have the means to work. That's why we're demanding justice so that the cop loaders of the right wing are punished. They want to see the Nicaraguan people subjected under the imperialists. That's why we tell them today, person is each one of our comrades who offer their lives for the peace. Because in Nicaragua, all Nicaraguans want peace. We'll take a short break now, but join us again after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting. en mercancía, lo imperan las leyes del mercado, es un escenario donde se compran los deportistas, se compran y se venden los deportistas como si fueran mercancía, donde hay una alta corrupción administrativa dentro del deporte, donde el flagelo del nefasto, del dopaje, también se va imponiendo, lamentablemente, en la competición deportiva. Y sin embargo la revolución cubana, un país pequeño como el nuestro, con escasos recursos económicos y financieros, ha tratado de seguir manteniendo la moral y la dignidad de deporte.
Welcome back. Syrian state television has announced an Israeli airstrike has hit a military post in the city of Misyaf in Syria's Hama province, but caused only material damage. The news flash did not elaborate on what exactly had been targeted. Last week, Syrian state media said Israeli rockets had struck a Syrian military position near Nairab airport on the outskirts of the city of Aleppo. Opposition sources said several Iranians were killed at a logistics site used by Iran's Revolutionary Guards near the airport. Some of Iran's military bases in Syria are next to Syrian military compounds, according to the intelligence source. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Senegalese President Macky Sall have signed trade accords during Xi's two-day visit. Although the details of the deal were not given, Senegal has also agreed to support China's Belt and Road Initiative. Both leaders said they would work towards general development, anti-terror peacekeeping, and maintaining social stability. China is Senegal's second biggest trade partner after France. She is on African tour and will be visiting Rwanda, South Africa, and Mauritius later this week. The development of China will bring more opportunities to Africa, and the development of Africa will bring a new energy to the development of China. Over 2,000 swimmers from 50 countries sang from Asia to Europe in the annual Bosphorus Cross-Continental Swimming Contest in Istanbul in Turkey. Istanbul Seaway marks the traditional boundary between Asia and Europe, and since 30 years, swimmers from around the world come to participate in this race. This year's competition was won by Dukan Ulak from Cyprus, who completed the 6.5 Seaway in 46 minutes, 58 seconds. The biggest challenge was uh, actually the current, I guess, um, because it was pretty uh, strong in 2016. So, and the, back, the biggest challenge was uh, not to come across the finish. So, probably that one. And um, the best thing about it is that uh, you are part of really uh, good movement. You are part of the flow, um, and. We are just so happy. <laughs> World's largest Alpine Horns Festival has concluded in Switzerland, where over 200 musicians participated this year. Dressed in traditional Swiss attire, the participants perform with their long Alpine wooden horns to vie for the world's best Alphorn players. Alphorns are commonly associated with the traditional Swiss agrarian culture, and in the past, herders used these horns to gather their cows at dusk. Now let's have a look at some other st uh, stories making headlines from around the world. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has claimed that on request of U.S. President and other Western leaders, they have evacuated over 400 volunteers and family members of the controversial White Helmet Organization from southwestern Syria. They have been taken to Jordan and later are supposed to be transferred to the U.K. and Canada, according to Netanyahu. A suicide bomber blew himself up outside the gate of the Kabul airport on Sunday, killing at least 11 people and injuring over a dozen others. The blast occurred shortly after Afghan Vice President Abdul Rashid Dostum landed at the airport from his self-imposed exile in Turkey. Officials said he was unharmed. Dostum had left Afghanistan in May 2017 amid accusations of kidnapping and rape of a political rival. To mark the fifth anniversary of the reintroduction of offshore detention centers of asylum seekers in Australia, thousands of protesters marched across major cities calling for an end to detention centers in the Manus Island and in Nauri in the Pacific. The Australian policy is seen by human rights activists as one of the most brutal in the world for isolating the refugees in distant detention centers with very limited access for journalists or human rights activists. There have been many reports of abuse and suicides in those centres. Any country that openly rejects compassion and instead tortures people who we know are innocent in order to make them a deterrent, any country that would do that has somehow lost its soul. Tens of thousands of people have marched in the streets of Bavarian state capital Munich in Germany to protest against the hardline immigration stand of their state government. The protests come three months before the state heads to the polls in what is considered to be a tough contest for Chancellor Angela Merkel's Bavarian allies, Christian Social Union. Protesters blame the CSU government of playing irresponsible divisive politics. And we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. 
And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for Telesur English. I am Stefania Bravo. Thank you for watching. by inequalities, abuse of power, and injustice. The American journalist Abby Martin covers the struggle for fundamental rights worldwide. Deepen into the search of files which uncover the empire's strategies. Through our screen and web platform, in English. The Empire Files with Abby Martin. Tuesday, only on. 31 days of adrenaline and celebration. Two experts, one passion. We enjoyed Russia 2018 together. In a way only we